Good evening. This is Strange Love, and I'm your host, Cami Chaos. Welcome, babies. Good evening, and welcome to Strange Love Live Tech Edition. I'm your host, Cami Chaos, and as always, I'm joined by Dr. Normal. Hello. This evening's guest we could have had on for many, many reasons, and many of them we will talk about later, but right now we're going to talk with Sean Levy uh, from the Oregonian about blogging and technology with newspapers. How are you doing, Sean? I'm doing great. Thanks so much. This is, this is incredibly cool. This is a great setup, and, and I'm charmed. Thank you. You like our lava lamp? <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I like everything I've seen. You guys, this is, this, is a wonderful, this is a wonderful situation. I commend you all to uh, come, and, come and see this. One at a time, please. <laughs> <laughs> so you have written for the Oregonian for how long? I started writing there as a freelancer in 1992, mm -hmm. and I became full-time film critic in 1997. And I started blogging there in 2005, 2004. I agitated for a blog for a long time, and they finally gave me my own little cubby hole. A little golden key yeah. to Sean's blog. Yeah. How do you see newspaper transitioning into the modern times? Boy, that's 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 a huge question. Um, you have this thing I think that people find equity in this this piece of paper that you can carry around with you. It's portable. It's inexpensive. It's recyclable. Mm -hmm. It's it's you know you're sitting somewhere eating a sandwich to to have a magazine or a newspaper in your hand is a good feeling and and uh, there's there's equity in that good feeling. People are willing to pay for it mm -hmm. and they'll pay more for something better. The New York Times gets more you know. Than, than the nickel ad, yeah. you know. Um, so, so I think there's a market for that, and you also have this this organizational um, aspect of newspapers, which is that they are great news gathering bodies. They they are editors, they are uh, designers and presenters, mm -hmm. and they've always done this in print, but increasingly they do it digitally. So you have that. There's equity in that. There's mm -hmm. equity in having good reporting and interesting writing and comprehensive information about who won the ball game, what time is the opera, you know, where's that new restaurant, this sort of thing that people in a community want. Yeah. So they're, they're good at that. But then you have the third part, which is that nobody wants to pay for it. They don't want to pay for that content, and they don't want to pay for the piece of paper by advertising in it or spending what it actually costs to get it to their house. Mm -hmm. You know, the newspaper business subsidizes that paper delivery with, and they profit on it with the advertising. Um, now, with less advertising, they're getting you a newspaper, and they have to charge more and more. Yeah. And people are going to cut it out because so much of the content has leaked online for free. It's a crazy business. So a lot of the newspaper, even though it's online for, if, if I pick up a newspaper, I am looking for things like uh, uh, reviews, comics, <laughs> I, I, I want, um, the, you know, the living section, uh, movie information, the ballet, uh, concerts, etc. crossword puzzle. I'm not really looking for the hard hitting news. It used to be that's where you got your news. You'd go to the newspaper and someone would have spent you know, so much of their time invested in uncovering the story. Mm -hmm. And now if you have that, it's going to be online or it's going to be on the news or it's going to be on one of those national well, news programs. There's, there's still a lot of enterprise reporting at the Oregonian. I mean, there's a smaller staff than we've had in mm -hmm. some time, although not much smaller than it was, say, 15 years ago. The, the paper actually grew for a while. I think now it's finally below that that level, but not, not ruinously so. I mm -hmm. mean, they, you know, um, they culled pretty carefully. Um, and, and there are enterprise stories and this is the sort of thing. I mean, that, that's, that's part of the mission. That's what you know, it's called an enterprise story. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where, where you give somebody, you give a reporter two or three guys who know how to work legal documents and, and, uh, and, and, uh, um, financial records and phone records and these sort of things. They know how to requisition documents. They know how to read them. Mm -hmm. And you, you set those guys loose for three, five months. They don't have to do anything else. Mm -hmm. And they're going to publish a story in three or five months on something that still goes on in the newsroom. And that aspect of journalism is it, it's that's a lot, kind of like being a teacher or a fireman. I mean, you are it's not that well paid a job. Yeah. Um, it's not really glamorous, especially the, the aspect of it we're talking about mm -hmm. reading county records in mm -hmm. your office for three months. Um, but people do it because it's in the public interest. Yeah. 
and I think I think newspapers still have that. That's that that portion of it that I was talking about. That's the people who are good at creating news stories, gathering news stories, editing them, making sure they're comprehensive, mm-hmm. making sure they're literate. You know, copy editors. Newspapers still have more copy editors than other businesses, so the writing that they do is going to be just well. The fact that they even have copy editors, yeah, yeah, because yeah. you go out into the blogosphere and myself included i don't have a copy editor when i write my little daily it's not even about anything but i don't have someone to go and look over it for me and that's one of the things about the newspaper and even the pieces that are posted online for newspaper sites that aren't in print i don't think that the same attention is paid to them yeah it depends it depends um my blog entries, I have two blogs on Oregon Live. Nobody mm-hmm. nobody sees those until I post them, mm-hmm. none of my editors. But then again, I've been there 15 years, you know, and, and they know what they're getting. Yeah. Um, there are community bloggers on Oregon Live, and I don't believe they're, you know, they're in a different portion of Oregon Live. I mean, it all comes to Oregon Live at the top, but mm-hmm. theirs is technically to one side. They answer to the people on... Where I think it's things they over by the Governor the Hotel. Blog people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To, well, to, to the advance, the advance internet office, mm-hmm. which is like ten blocks from the Oregonian. Those are the people who actually run Oregon Live. They have these community bloggers. I don't think anyone edits their stuff. So they're not held to the same standards as the journalists. Uh, the print journalists definitely no. Um, but as I'm saying, my stuff that I put on Oregon Live goes up without an editor. But then again. On my blog, on my my movie blog, Mm -hmm. everything that I have that's published in the paper appears. Mm -hmm. And that stuff's all been copy edited and fact checked and and CQ'd. Uh, CQ is when you say, this is how the name is spelled, C-A-M-I space K-A-O-S. CQ means, I just staked my firstborn on it. I I blow (laughs) that all the time. (laughs) I am a bad CQ slut. What does it stand for? Checked. Oh. Check. 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 Okay. I swear things are checked and no, they're not. No, no. I'm wrong. Copy editors hate my guts, but they've saved my <laughs> ass so many times. Yeah. You know, and that that the, that's on books. You know, not on Twitter. Yeah. Twitter's <laughs> a beautiful thing. You can make it mistakes amazing. and blame your iPhone. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's what I do iPhone auto fixes my thing. Oh, yeah, no, I turned that off. Oh, I'd, I'd, uh, I'm a bad speller anyhow. I don't care. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Normal, you always have something to weigh in on the newspaper technology. It's one of your favorite get-off-my-lawn subjects. Well, I, I think it's interesting. You were uh, just talking about um, how your editors don't see anything on your blog, so your blog is completely separate from your reporting. In other words, you just go out and you publish on your blog, and then you're you're writing. I mean, how how does how do you synchronize that, and how do you reconcile that? Well, it, it, as I say, I've been there a long time, and they know. You know, I always understood exactly. A sh- I, I I always had ideas about what shapes my blog should have, and my editors had that conversation with me, and they trusted me to you know to hold the standards and practices. I wasn't going to talk in the on an Oregon Live blog the way I might, you know, before a match with the Timbers <laughs> in the pub. H- so have you ever had a conflict of interest? I mean, it's something that you posted on your blog that kind of didn't work uh, being uh, on the staff of the Oregonian? No, no, because, you know, I, I understand that when I'm wearing that Oregon Live and Oregonian hat, that's the deal I've got with them. You know, they've never stopped me from doing outside projects so long as it wasn't a competitive market. You know, they wouldn't let me write for Willamette Week, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> if I asked. Lung town. Yeah, they'd say no. Um, uh, but, you know, there was a time when I was a freelancer when I wrote for the Oregonian and for PDXS, the Jim, Jim and Bill Redden's paper, Catherine Dunn financed. I was the, the first film critic. I had a, a video column called Hollywood in a Box, and uh, when DK Home left Willamette Week and went over to PDXS, that was a few months after I had left PDXS for the Oregonian. I, I think I'm the only PDXS veteran in the newsroom. Remember that paper? It, was, it, it wasn't bad. Yeah, vaguely. <laughs> yeah, it, was a, it was a tall, skinny paper folded in half. It was about 16 pages. It had all of Jim Redden's conspiracy theory stuff. <laughs> oh, and Catherine, Catherine Dunn wrote about boxing. <laughs> I wrote about movies. 
What years? What year was it? Oh, 92 to 96 yeah. in there. You, I think you moved here just a few years before I did. Uh, we moved here this month, June of 92. In fact, this is an echt Oregon moment. We arrived at my in-law's house in Tigard at the end of the third quarter of Game 6 of the NBA Finals of 1992. The Blazers were up, oh my God. and they were about yeah. to send the game, the, the, the series into a seventh game. Mm-hmm. I sat in my father-in-law's easy chair. I had my first <laughs> Oregon microbrew as an Oregon, you know, we were here. Mm-hmm. And the Blazers blew the lead. So it was oh. you. Yeah, it was you know, you. you know. Thanks a lot for but, that. But it was really cool <laughs> driving up all the way. You know, we had spent the night. We somewhere. were very hopeful. You know. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> but it's Oregon, man. Second is good. Look, there are fifty, right? How many states are there? But second is good. I you know, that's not bad. <laughs> yeah, if you're okay. a blazer and you don't have a Walton playing for you, second's always good. Yeah, yeah. If you wanted to be first all the time, I don't think you would move to Oregon. Yeah, I, I think the appeal of it is that you know. It's okay. Having to be first all the time is for neurotics. So, um, <laughs> I'm from New York. Seattle looks like Mayberry. <laughs> so, is, yeah, you're n- you're another one of these reporter transplants. We've had uh, Steve Woodward uh-huh. here as well. Uh, you know, keep Oregon, keep Portland weird. You know, quite the. Uh, is it keep Portland weird? Or yeah, keep, yeah, keep keep Portland, Portland weird, weird. You know. Um, so he's quite the uh, enthusiast for for well, Portland, he did a lot obviously. of feature, feature yeah. writing. So he got to meet people yeah. in all all sorts of walks of life. You know, that's another thing you have in a newspaper. A guy, a guy who does the job that Steve Woodward or, or currently guys like Andy Dwork and Larry Bingham, if you if you know the bylines in the paper, um, Julie Sullivan. They just go into the community and they talk to people who, you know, they could do an article on on your setup here. I mean, this would be interesting to people. There's a house near where I go to the bookstore that uh, has a cool studio in the basement and has all these interesting people coming through that that's a feature story um blogging about your own experience of it is not so interesting as having someone assigned here by an editor and given that (laughs) imprimatur and let's remember something the oregonian circulation has gone down but they sell like three hundred thousand of those things every day plus 300 plus that's a lot. This is Portland, Oregon. That's one that for every, lot. you know, every one for every four people. And we know that more than one person reads the paper. In my house, three people read the paper, mm-hmm. you know. So it's, there's such equity in that. that and it's just in that silly piece of paper. And, you know, the biggest, the biggest news-related blogs, you know, something like Drudge or Huffington Post or, you know, uh, Talking Points Memo, don't quite have that hold in every community you know a newspaper has that hold in a community well indeed but as generations come up they for some re you know they don't want to hold that paper right they want to uh fl- you know finger flick on their their iphone or yeah, or yeah, yeah. you know their kindle or something like you that know. i think that's the difference i you know here we've talked about and there's there has been a since we st- started this podcast and and i think we had steve woodward on way back when you know there's been this discussion and we oh. saw the foreshadowing of what's been going on with some of the bankruptcies and all of that but um you know i think that the tech people it's not the journalism that they they want to get they want the journalism right, right, it's right. just Cheers. what's the economic model and how does that work into where we're going for the news you know yeah, the yeah. google homepage the rss feeds twitter um mm-hmm. you know that's the, the 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 feed that we're getting you right, know right right how, right how do how do you guys monetize that and bring your skills and how do you maintain the journalistic aspect of it and make sure that everyone well, that, their bylines? That you do it. That that you do with money. That you do with staff. You know, yeah. the single biggest expense at the Oregonian every year is salary and, and benefits. Um, I you know I don't I don't know too much. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think about it economically too often, um, in part because um, the Oregonian is in, is in a, a, a sort of a unique position in this whole economy of newspapers. It's privately owned. It's owned as entirely by, by a company that's entirely in the media, Condé Nast magazines and advanced newspapers. And it's a family business that was founded by newspaper men. The people who run it now are, are lifelong newspaper men and their children are in the business. And they don't have any stockholders. And the Oregonian's been pretty profitable for them. 
Most years, in fact all but a very small handful of years, there's been profit in this thing. So I feel kind of sanguine about the Oregonian for as long as I'm going to be interested mm -hmm. in writing for a newspaper, personally, greedily. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of don't think too much but, about the money question. Yeah, it's interesting, though, because certainly, uh, even though the Oregonian may be, um, you know, sound financially, certainly circulation has gone down over the years and classified ads. That's, which is that's where the brutal that's thing. The, yeah. Yeah. Oh, how about this G.I. Joe's? G.I. Joe's being out of business. Yeah. How big an account was that for the Oregonian? Sure. Montgomery Ward went out, what, six years ago? Yeah. And I was in a meeting where someone said that's, that's a seven-digit loss for us. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't ever think about it, but every time I picked up a newspaper prior to G.I. Joe's closing, every single time I saw yeah. G.I. Yeah. Joe's out of yeah. it. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a huge account. I know, I know. Of course, there is still fries. <laughs> there is still fries. Oh, I have a classic. Full page. Full page. Does anyone else have this? I have a classic fries ad from like 10 years ago. Um, where their little motto is, somebody wrote, you know, home of hard to find, obnoxious, you know, ill educated service. It was, I mean, <laughs> it was an actual fries ad, and someone took their little motto and had rewritten it. I, I, I only have the words about 70% right. I still, you see, if that had appeared online, that would not be fun to keep. Yeah. But having that newspaper and being yeah. able to show it to someone. That artifact, I know the yeah, kids. Screen kids, kids, kids don't here the or are the oh, guests? And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know how they, if if the if the last person who has a paper delivered to their house or buys one at a train station dies, I don't know how those people who are going to be running newspapers at that time are going to make money to support the journalism that everyone agrees. Is is is, is 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 yeah? It's important. It, it ranges from important to entertaining. Mm -hmm. It's certainly distracting. You know, entertainment is important too. I know, I know. I I, I think so. I, God knows, I've spent a lot of time, you know, arguing that it's important. Um, so I don't know how those guys are going to do it. But like I say, I'm probably not going to be in the newspaper business when that happens. I'm going to probably be dead. I think. <laughs> I, I think. I think I will still or you'll see be newspapers. Online. Well, I, I, I've been online since, like, the, the early yeah, 80s, you yeah. know. I, I, of course. Um, and but as a presence online, yeah, as, yeah, a, well, as a Twitter presence, as well, a blogging presence. As as a, yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the as a, Sean someone Levy writing feed, about books, right? you know, and sports. And, and you know, my, writing about the, my book projects, writing about sports, right. writing about movies. Um, there's a lot of things I don't write about because... Um, because of my position at the Oregonian, I've always been respectful of the fact that I've been given the privilege to talk my mind about something that I stay out of other areas. I haven't reviewed a book in the Oregonian in like 12 years. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I was a freelancer, I did articles for the sports section. I did some business writing. I haven't touched anything like that since, since I got hired full time. And... In the blogging world, I've, I've kept the same thing. They let me blog about movies and world soccer. And that's what I blog about. I don't blog about my life. I tweet about them. You know, my, my life. But I don't blog about it. And the Twitter feed is not through the Oregonian. The, the blogs Twitter are, feed is just you. That's just me. I put my name on it. Um, after becoming overly ebullient with it for about a month, I found my groove... Oh, and I created, um, you, you will be glad or indifferent to know, um, <laughs> Sean Levy Live, a Twitter account. So when I'm going to live tweet soccer games or um, uh, James Ivory and Gus Van Zandt, I'll just mm -hmm. tweet, I'm doing this over there. So they can follow. So that people don't get you know 60 incomprehensible feeds about it, uh, tweets about Italian soccer in their I tweet deck. I believe that BMW does the same thing he when he's And uh, Anne-Marie Cox does it. That's who I stole it from. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, you know, Sean Levy Live, it's got my baby picture, and you can listen <laughs> to me scream. I've, uh, I have unfollowed people briefly and then had to go back. Yeah, and yeah, we've all done that. have been at tech yeah. conferences, and yeah, I've just yeah, been like, yeah. oh, like people are doing stop. that now. Yeah. I, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, uh, and, you know, it's, uh, you turn it on when it's on, and you, when it's not on, no one cares because they mm -hmm. don't see it. Oh, I'd like ahead. to move to uh, book publishing, and we can talk about the book a little bit but the, how technology has changed uh, book publishing i'm i'm sitting can here I, looking at the screen with uh, I, um yes that uh 
this is Paul Newman of Life. I wrote yes. this book at Active Space last year. And it just came out last month, right? It came out May 5th. Yeah, it's been oh, five wow. weeks. New York it. Times bestseller. <laughs> Congratulations. Take that, Kitty Kelly. Ooh. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. This is your what fifth a daffy book? thing. This is my fifth book. Um, I've written them all in Oregon. I've ri- mentioned Oregon or Portland in all five books, including the one about the Latin playboy from the Dominican Republic. <laughs> that that was a limbo move. Let me hard tell to you. Work in? No, no, no. Zsa, Zsa Gabor got into a public spat with a congressman called Charles Hayes. Charles Hayes. Mm. Charles O. Hayes from McMinnville from the fifties. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I I was like, oh, here darling. it is. Here it is. <laughs> yeah, I got it into my swinging London book, my Rat Pack book. That was cool. How did you work Portland into the swinging London book? You know what? I can't remember. <laughs> I swear to you, since since I, 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 I know how he got Newman in the Oregon book. Oh, he was. Here, I, I've yeah. seen the photographs at Moe's. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> New, Newman, Newman, in Newport. <laughs> there's great stories about Newman at Portland International Raceway in this oh, book, yeah. and there's stories about him on the set of Sometimes a Great Notion. Mm-hmm. And uh, when he designed those hole in the wall camps for the uh, severely ill children, mm-hmm. these camps that are now all over the world. His instruction to the architect for the first one was, I want it to look like an Oregon logging camp. Mm. Wow. And that's, I mean, how dear. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, tell books. So, so how about, um, so you're, you're on the Kindle? correct yeah i am and i mean i keep meaning to buy my book on kindle to have yeah. it on my iphone and i haven't and you're on uh, are your other books on kindle no i don't believe so the last one was published in 2005 six i can't mm-hmm. recall and it didn't sell much and the one before that was 2003 and it didn't sell much so, so this is the first time that you've had a book that's on new technology well, I've got cassettes yeah, he's on, of you're my on Jerry Lewis book, <laughs> right? You're on Audible. Yeah, and I've got uh, Audible, yeah. Audible, uh, Audible, no, Audible. in fact, I believe oh. I believe the last Playboy, the previous book, was mm-hmm. was uh, you could download it as as an audio file, um, and I have CDs. That's some Who terrible. The books? Oh, some some hack. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I listened to these sentences. I you know, was, it I can get a sample and. Uh, it was it was difficult to listen to, you know, partly because they just cut the text so much, and they just. I had, always wonder. Yeah, I've never yeah. listened to books Mark on tape Cash- or Mark Cashman. Cashman. Oh, God bless him. You know, I'm sure he's a, a, a lovely, <laughs> sure he's a great father and a good dancer, and you know. <laughs> no, that was the uh, Newman book. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we'll yeah. listened to a little of Mark. I know, I know, and he's reading <laughs> my sentences. The craziest was the Jerry Lewis book. My first book uh, was read on cassettes by Marty Ingalls, the wife of Shirley, oh, the husband oh of Shirley Jones, the Absolutely. old comedian. <clears throat> and the first time I listened to that boy, I had to have a stiff drink because <laughs> whatever <laughs> voice that was in my head when I was writing the book was not the voice of Marty Ingalls. That's what <laughs> I wondered because when I sit there and I read a book, and your book has so much narrative and there's quotes in there, and you're reading it, and, and as a reader, you kind of develop your own... Um, you hear a you, voice. You hear a ear. voice. If if you, I mean, I do. I hear a voice. I picture things. I see things. So for me, books and movies never really mesh up. Mm-hmm. But I'm reading it, and I'm always wondering. Then when they have the quotes of the people, I always do they hear. Do voices? Like, do they do the voices? Like when no, I read no, my daughter no. a bedtime <laughs> story, <laughs> they have the well, little voices. Fiction. Yeah, in fiction, you could do that. You you know, yeah. it, it would maybe it would I should be... just listen to one sometime. I've never yeah. listened. To, I just. Ugh. I think books on tape is a bad idea for me. But, you know, I, I I, I, if I was going to drive to, you know, Texas and I could get, like, Ian McKellen reading the Iliad, mm. I would put that on in the car, you know? Yeah, there are... That, that's when I would do it, but... Uh, Ian McKellen reading the phone book would yeah, be yeah, awesome yeah. if you're driving exactly. to Texas. I talked to Morgan Freeman once, and I said to him, Mr. Oh, Freeman... Oh, I would listen to him yeah. say just about uh, Well, I said, you know how people say they would pay to hear you, <laughs> pay to see you read the phone book? He says, yes. I said, well, I would pay to see you read the phone book to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, oh, my. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. He could narrate. He was, the, yeah, there. yeah, yeah. To have that syrupy voice on your telephone at yeah. work, what a great job. So maybe for me, I just need to find ones that are well narrated by the correct yeah, people, yeah, and yeah. then the content won't matter. <laughs> I, 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 I keep meaning to go on eBay and get a copy of Sean Penn reading Dylan's autobiography. How, how could that not be awesome? That's one of the best books I ever read. Sean Penn doing that? I'll listen to that. 
I wonder if they if they are searchable by the narr- by the. Uh, I, 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 I wonder if it's are. not on iTunes. You know. Yeah, I think they they might be. Well, uh, there's a link into your iPhone and your iPod for Audible. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another one audible another <laughs> podcast that needs sponsoring, by the way. Um, um, when you figure out how to better know. monetize yeah, things yeah, online, yeah. Yeah, won't yeah, you yeah. let yeah. us know? One thing I want to mention, and this has been mentioned a lot in the press, and uh, when we had uh, Brian Westbrook on, he brought his Kindle, mm-hmm. and there is a synthesized reader, a uh, reader that sounds like Stephen Hawking, pretty much narrating the words, like you can do that on your computer. And that's been very controversial for authors, because presumably because of lost revenue with these like uh, book reading uh, contracts like like an audible oh, oh but those I, I don't believe those are very lucrative contracts I the only person who would be hurt by a contract like that would be like but a lot John, of the John authors Bush actually had Stephen that King. forced amazon to turn that off well that, yeah that was I mean, P, that was pr amazon shouldn't be in the business of you know ticking but off authors a, but you know you, i can't imagine <coughs> wanting to listen to that so as an author you don't feel no, Your publisher but, might feel differently, but well, it's an because author. my publisher is dealing in, in seven thousand yeah. authors, you know. Yeah. But for right. me, if I sell fifty of those CDs, I, I mean, I got I got a, 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 a bag of these CDs from my agent the other day, and I was like, oh, oh, what wow. am I going to do with these? <laughs> you know, the publisher sent me like ten or twelve. You know, it's a guy reading a cut-up version of my book in a terrible voice that so I wouldn't want to hear. So you really that's prefer so people buying the text? Yeah, that's what I wrote. You know, I have an MFA in poetry. I'm a writer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Interesting. I, I wrote it this way. It was really hard. I made those words. I chose them really carefully. I even checked the spelling. And, to, and the experience is more, you know, I, I should be reading your words. I shouldn't be commuting and you should be reading some guy no reading well but but that's not it, that's it, it's it's an abridged version of the text i mean you know, they cut mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. book is like 160 170 thousand words yeah, yeah you know this guy is reading something like forty five thousand words hmm. you know it's a flip book of the book you know hmm. it's not it's not what i wrote like i said you know for me writing you know and this is this is why i took so naturally to blogging and to twitter i you know i, I my, on my, on my twitter homepage it says born to tweet because I can type these things that I'm saying as fast as I can say them. Mm-hmm. And I know enough about writing now to shape it a certain way. So I want people to get that whole experience. The web is great for that because you can write at length. But right now people seem to be willing to put my stuff on pulped trees and pay me for it. Mm-hmm. I so, like pulped trees. Yeah, books. everyone likes books. Everyone likes everyone likes. That's newspaper. the funny thing. is, I'm, I'm not... But maybe it's the newsprint, it. whatever. I'm not as attached emotionally to holding in the newspaper but you read a magazine like if you're on no. an airplane or in a you know i don't really read magazines no, but books no, i read books. Okay. although i fell in love with the kindle when when brian brought it on but i still like to curl up every night before i go to sleep with a book and you in see my that lap book jacket that's exactly what they were thinking wasn't mm-hmm. it wasn't it mm-hmm. <laughs> you see people want to know how you get in the new york times bestseller list beefcake <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've written other books book. that I like just as well as this that didn't succeed. This one is special because it's got him on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. We'll we'll be talking a little bit more. Yeah. After and after hours, actually, okay, we'll talk cheers, about yeah. the non-tech. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Although I'm obsessed now with the cut-down version of this is maybe why I never listen to books on tape or anything because I like the the words that go into it. I think yeah, that the yeah, way yeah. the story is told is almost sometimes more important than the story itself and if they're hacking all the words out dr normal staring at me like i'm crazy but well i, I, I would I rather i would rather take 10 times longer necessarily i mean maybe it's the cds but i don't think well, that all the audio books are necessarily abridged that well no no think about it because think about how uh, long actually, it takes you, know, you to read a book uh, and how long it takes you quite, to listen. quite a few of them uh, a high percentage of them really? are because we bought this fellow's time, this this actor oh, who sure. wrote the script, right. and it's you know they cut and... they cut twenty five, seventy five percent, seventy sixty, some some huge chunk of the book out. Yeah. Well, they they would have had to spend triple to get it all in. Did he um, at least read that first? And and they would have had these this hard product. I have to you find know, that, that they had to sell that was suddenly three crazy CDs. Crazy fascinated. Mm-hmm. You know. Because some some of those Ian McKellen type things, yeah. and and uh, I'm not kidding, there is oh Derek Jacobi also oh, has yeah. recorded some some uh, like Canterbury Tales or something like that. How could you not want to hear something like that? 
And um, but those are like eighty dollars because they're like seven or eight CDs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm sure the downloads of them are, are are premium priced. You know, because a lot of time and money went into making the thing. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I do it. And 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 again, reading the text on the Kindle, reading it on the iPhone, you know, reading the app. Oh, that that I don't in, find that objectionable. But the um, text yeah. isn't changed. It's yeah, yeah. You know, from the just from as long the, the content's not abridged. View, that's your big, yeah, your biggest yeah, complaint. Uh, you know, the the right of the author. You know, the the creator of anything. You know, if if you if you made a painting, sure. someone couldn't tint it a different, <laughs> you know, he, he, color palette and. You know, call it yours. You know, so your music. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. someone can't just put it in a new key and add other instruments and then say this is you know your piece. Right. That's how I feel about this. That said, they paid for the right to run a abridged copy. They ran the script by me, but ha, huh, I was reading the book so many times at full length that someone's saying, "Hey, here's a fifth of your book that you can read again for the hell of it." I know they they would have had to put a gun to you my just head. Said, yeah, I said, you know what, mate? I trust you. All right. I think that we're going to head on into After Hours now, uh, where we're going to talk more about Paul Newman, A Life, and the Timbers Army. And uh, please join us next week when we're going to be at the OS Bridge Convention Wednesday and Thursday and doing the after party Friday evening at 8. That's right. See you later. Stay tuned for After Hours. Thank you.